Good morning, good morning. We are so happy that you are here to worship the Lord with us this morning. We are uh, we're going to open our service by singing to the King. We're going to sing number 10 in the hymnal. This is Psalm 2, the second psalm. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sets in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. I will tell of this decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Isaiah 42, 1, 10, and 13. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, From the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other. 
nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. The Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war. He stirs up his zeal. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 26. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead aren't raised. If, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have uh, fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, his love.
Shepherd, may I sing a prayer within your house forever, within your house forever. Would you pray with me as we, uh, as we dive in here? Our Father in heaven, we just thank you so much that we have this book in front of us, that we have your word given to us, handed down by the apostles and put together by the the early church, and we have it here in our own language that we can read and study and understand. And Lord, I also thank you that we have your spirit to illuminate the text for us. And I pray this morning, God, that you would do just that, that you would speak to our hearts, that as we study these words and we talk about what it means to have a proper view of Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would, uh, that you would just speak directly to our hearts. We praise you, God, and we thank you, and it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So this morning, uh, this sermon that I'm going to do is birthed out of lessons that I am currently learning and I have learned over the past, I'm going to say, two or three years. Uh, At least something that I have really come to, uh, in my own life, come to grips with in the past three three years or so. Um, Earlier uh, this month, I was 
part of a hostage situation, otherwise known as a, I was in a text group. Um, if you've ever been in a text group, you know how much of a hostage situation that it feels like because people are like, you're, you're, you're kind of ignoring your phone and all of a sudden it starts beeping nonstop and you're like, what is going on? And look, and it's just people talking back and forth that you really are not part of the conversation. And so uh, I was in one of these text groups, uh, one of the many Bible studies that I'm involved in throughout the week. And uh, man, these guys were just, uh, it, was, it was right around the time when the Silicon Valley Bank uh, the news came out that there was some big problem with, with that bank. And, uh, man, these guys in this text group, as much as I love them, they were just, I mean, doom and gloom and the country is going down and the banks are collapsing and our enemies are, are uh, gaining power and, you know, it's hard to see this isn't intentional and on and on and on. It was just doom and gloom all the way. And as I'm trying to ignore this message, the, these text messages, because I'm in the middle of doing something way more important than this conversation, uh, I just kind of, I, I felt I had to chime in. Uh, I couldn't hold my tongue anymore. And this is roughly what I, what I said. There was more involved in it. But I just, I messaged, I, I finally chimed in and I said to these guys, dudes, Jesus is king now, right now, he is king. And I said, it doesn't matter it, what bank falls, what enemy gets, gets stronger, it doesn't even matter, ultimately, the collapse of whatever nation. None of that changes the reality that Jesus is king, and he is on his throne right now. Now, don't, please hear me this morning. I'm not saying that we should not be concerned with what's going on in our culture and not be concerned about what's going on in our country. We certainly should be. But we can't be concerned about it at the expense of knowing and living in the reality that Jesus is king. And I quoted to these guys Psalm 2. I said, since the beginning of time, the kings of the earth have taken their stand against God and against his anointed. And he who sits in the heavens and always will, he laughs at them. <laughs> I, think, I think that is fantastic. That all of these kings, presidents, whatever, whoever, dictators, they can take their stand against God. And he who sits in the heavens laughs at him. That's awesome to me. And that tells me that because he's laughing, he is truly in charge. He's the one who's on the throne. And nothing that goes on here is ever going to change that. And so... As one of the pastors of this church, myself and I know Pastor David, we've had conversations about this before, we are, we are bound, we have a duty to make sure that each one of you has a proper uh, Christology, or in other words, you have a proper view of who Jesus is, and it's our job to encourage you to live by that view, to live in that reality. And that is a job that I take very seriously because Jesus is king and we need to live our lives in that reality. We need to live our lives knowing that he is king and our lives should reflect that. So to do that this morning, I want to look at uh, Revelation chapter 1. So if you would turn there with me, please. Now, as I do, I, I, if, I'd like to take just a few moments here. I don't want to uh, belabor this, but I'd like to play professor and just kind of give you the nuts and bolts of the book of Revelation. Because uh, of all the books, of all the 66 in the Bible, this one, I think, is the most misunderstood, and it, people fear it. Other people are so intrigued by it, you know, kind of all over the board. So let me just give you quickly the nuts and bolts of this. John was given this revelation of Jesus, which we're going to read here in a moment. 
to write to seven churches who were in uh, what we would consider modern-day Turkey. Uh, believers in these churches had already faced massive amounts of persecution, and there was no end in sight. So when they would have read or discussed what we're going to discuss this morning, they would have been totally jazzed to hear that. They would have loved to have heard Jesus is king, and he has already won the battle. And so even though we are facing, and, and we ourselves today might be at the beginning of facing persecution in this country, who knows? O only the Lord knows. But whatever is going to happen, we need to face it with the reality that Jesus is king, and he has already won. The battle is over. Uh, the believers in, in the first century that would have gotten this book, they would have loved to have heard this because, as I said, they had already experienced so much persecution and they knew that more was on the horizon. Now, if John was living today and he was in college and he was writing the book of Revelation as a paper for one of his classes, um, if it was an English, English class, he would have gotten probably 150% on it. Because the way this book is written is so creative. I mean, there's some really weird stuff in here. <laughs> Let's be honest. But the way that it is written, the, the imagery he uses and, and the uh, format and all of the literary devices that I learned in school are now leaving my head. Um, just, just the way that he wrote this, the way that it's woven together and, and refers to itself and back to the Old Testament is fascinating. And one of the things... If, if you uh, were in the Wednesday night youth and adult class that we had a few months ago, I talked about this. One of the things about the book of Revelation is there's what, what Vody Bauckham calls the Revelation waltz. It has kind of a one, two, three, one, two, three to it. Um, the judgments come in threes. Of course, the Trinity is three. Uh, even here in the the seven verses we're going to read, we will see threes upon threes. And so I encourage you to kind of look at that as we read. Now, if John was writing this for a theology class and claiming that it was an original work, he would have gotten uh, hit with about 400 counts of plagiarism. Or no, excuse me, 200 counts of plagiarism. Because there's about 400 verses in the book of Revelation, and 200 of them are direct references, I mean, almost direct quotes, to the Old Testament. And so that's one of the things that makes this book so interesting, is that there are so many callbacks to the Old Testament, uh, taking imagery from the Old Testament and bringing, for, bringing it forward to reveal what God is about to do through his son. Uh, it's just fascinating. So, Knowing that, and again, I challenge you as we read these seven verses to look for these pattern, look for this pattern of threes. But let's read together Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him, all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Now, to gain a proper view of who Jesus is, I would like to focus this morning on verse 5. Thank you for clicking through there, Brandon. All right, so, number one, in verse 5, we see that Jesus is, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. 
Now, one of the things that right off the bat that we see about this is that it highlights uh, the dual nature of Jesus. Pastor David spoke about this uh, a few weeks ago. I think it was in the Monday Thursday service. That Jesus is the God-man. He is both fully God and fully man together. And as the faithful witness, we see this come out where he is both fully God and fully man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, I can't, to my recollection, there is no other, I'll say, organized religious thing on earth where the God, the deity that is worshipped, comes down and becomes a man and joins in the the muck and the mire of the world that his creatures are in and then sacrifices himself to redeem them from that muck and mire. You know, at Christmas time, we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. And I just love that phrase because it really encapsulates who Jesus is. God with us. God no longer is far off. He's no longer in a temple or in the heavens. He is right here with us. And through Jesus, we have the opportunity to have that relationship with him here with us. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. I'll I'll read, I'll start here in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus, as the God-man, as the faithful witness, it highlights his dual nature. Now, what does this mean for us? Two things. Number one, he bore witness to us about God. We have an entire book full of it, four gospels full of it, of Jesus coming and telling us who who God is, what God is like, what he expects of us, uh, bringing the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, here to us. All of the events in the gospels that we read about in Jesus' life, and Interestingly, John says, you know, in, in, at the end of his, his gospel, that if we were to write all the things that Jesus did, uh, the world would not be able to contain the volumes that it would hold. And so what we have in the gospels, I think, is even just a glimpse of what Jesus did, but it's enough to tell us who he is and, and what he did for us, how he faithfully preached and he healed and he brought the kingdom of heaven here with us, how he sacrificed himself for our sins. Uh, The the Gospel of Matthew highlights that Jesus is the true Israelite, that he came to tell the world who God is. That was the job that the nation of Israel should have done. Uh, They were to be God's people to tell the world what God was like. And that, of course, is what Jesus did. Uh, John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The second thing that this means for us is that he bears witness to God about us. Oh, that was a, I was a little quick on the draw there. There we go, okay. He bears witness to God about us. He is the mediator between God and man. And as the faithful witness, he faithfully witnesses to God about us, those of us who have surrendered ourselves to him. uh, He, is, as the mediator, stands between God and man. He says in John um, 14, 6, he is the only way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And I also would like to read um, Romans 8, starting in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. How will he also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? What shall separate us? From the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. These believers in, in the early church, uh, they were facing massive amounts of persecution. And if they would have heard, when they heard these words that Jesus is the faithful witness I think that would have been such a relief to them that God, that Jesus is going to faithfully witness to the Father of the witness that they have held, that they have kept the faith, that they have suffered for his namesake, that they have, uh, some of them even gone to martyrdom. Jesus faithfully witnesses uh, on our count to the Father. The second thing that, that uh, is, is said here in verse 5, he is the firstborn from among the dead. And we just got done celebrating uh, what this means. Now, if Jesus is the first, that means that there's going to be a second and a third and many to follow after. So being the firstborn from among the dead means that he is the first one to physically, bodily resurrect. You know, there are many uh, cults, many, I'll say, cultish sections of Christianity that take this verse and use it to say that Jesus, uh, well, much like Pastor David highlighted uh, on Monday, Thursday, uh, they take this verse, uh, especially, oh, sorry, my mind is, I'm jumping all over the place here. Um, they will take this verse and use it to say that Jesus is not actually God, because if he is the firstborn, that means that he must have been created at some point. That's not what this is saying. That's not what this title of Jesus means. Being the firstborn from among the dead means that he is the first one to resurrect uh, to new life. And if he's the first, that means there will be many to follow after him. And I don't know about you, but I praise God for that, because if Jesus resurrected, because of his resurrection, we shall be resurrected also in new life. He, in essence, blazed the resurrection trail. He was the first one to make the trail so that we could follow at the completion of all things. Um, I, think, I think of it like this. A few years ago, actually, this was, this was probably the first year that I came here. Uh, we did an all-nighter. Gary Murray probably remembers this. Um, we, we did an all-nighter, and I, um, this was back when I didn't mind all-nighters. <laughs> I mind them very much now. Um, but, but to kind of end, the, end our events, I thought it would be great to take the group for a hike, like right as sunrise was coming, and we could go to this point and kind of watch the sunrise and do a little devotion. It'll be awesome. So we drove uh, out towards Waynesboro. We went to the Appalachian Trail. I had... I had scouted this out beforehand. I found this spot that is kind of up, up on a hill so you could sort of see the sunrise, the sun coming through the trees. I'm like, this is going to be great. So we get there that morning. And uh, I get out of the van. And Tanner Elliott is there with me. And I was like, hey, Tanner, do you, do you want to lead this? Like, you just follow the trail, and I'll, I'll tell you when to stop. And he just looked me dead in the face and said, nope. And I was like, all right, 
that's kind of weird. I'll, I'll lead, no, no problem. Well, four seconds on the trail, I realized why he didn't want to lead. Because I was the one clearing all the spider webs for everyone else. <laughs> so about the, about the fourth one in, when I'm doing this, I just hear Tanner behind me going, <laughs> so Jesus blazed the trail for us. He has cleared the spider webs for us on the trail of resurrection. He, he has made the way that one day, at the completion of all things, we too will be resurrected to new life. Romans 6, 3 and 4 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, this is side trail, this is why baptism is so important, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. As the firstborn from among the dead, it means that when we gather here on Sunday morning, we are not gathering in memorial of Jesus. We are gathered here to worship the living, risen Christ. Our God is alive today. Jesus lives today. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. We do not meet here to celebrate in, in, in a, as I said, a memorial setting, we worship a living Messiah. This is not just a, you know, when we come together and we say, you know, Jesus is alive, it isn't just a, a spiritual, churchy thing that we say. This isn't churchy language. It's reality. Jesus lives. And because he lives, we too can have newness of life. 1 Corinthians, this, this is a long one, I'll, so I'll read it. 1 Corinthians 15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. There's that term again. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Let me say that again. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The universe is here. You are here because Jesus lives. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the, the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn of the dead. And he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Let me tell you that I say, I, I, it gives me great pleasure to say this. God is not running a campaign to be God. It's just who he is. He doesn't need to run an election. This, 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 this amazes me. When people say things like, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be an atheist, but when people say things like, I don't believe in God, they say it as if that's going to, have some kind of effect, like God's, I don't know, like it's a negative vote for him, so, you know, he's not as much of God as he is if you did believe. He's God whether you believe it or not. And the problem is, is that if you don't believe it now, one day you're going to be face to face with him. And if you don't believe it now, that is not going to be a good situation then. God doesn't need to run a campaign to be God. It's who he is. 
And Jesus is his son. And so Jesus' rule is absolute. There is no wavering. I love the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 18, when he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What, what, is, what is left out of all authority? Nothing. All authority means all of it. There's not some authority over here in the corner that, that he doesn't have a hold of. All authority in heaven and on earth. Where else is there? Nowhere. Not a place nowhere. I mean, literally, there's no other place. Heaven and earth encompasses all. So he has all authority everywhere. It's all been given to him. Uh, the, the verse that, um, that Mark read in 1 Corinthians 15, I love where he's, it says, he must reign. I, I love that. Jesus' rule is absolute. There is no wavering. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And they can do anything they want to try and knock him off his throne. It ain't going to happen. Jesus is king. And again, just to drive this home a little more, this is a reality here and now. This is not some future thing that we are talking about where one day after, you know, a thousand years or whatever, Jesus is going to reign. No. This is true now. He is reigning today, here and now. It is a current reality that Jesus is alive and that he is king. And if you believe that, join me in saying, Amen. 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 Hebrews chapter 1. I'll just read the, the first verse so we can keep moving here. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation, representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So what does this mean for us? Well, a few things. Number one, the gospel is true. If Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth, if he is on his throne now, it means the gospel is true. That God created the world and that he created man and put man in a garden and gave him uh, a mandate to be obeyed. He gave him a command to obey. And he, he told man, if you obey this perpetually, if you obey me from now on, I will give you life. But if you disobey me, the result will be death. And because that one man disobeyed, sin entered the world, and death through sin. And everyone born from that man through ordinary generation inherits that sin. And from that sin nature comes, uh, sins proceed. And so our world is broken because of that sin. And we stand guilty before a holy and righteous God, and we know that he's holy, we know that he's righteous. Deep down in the core of our hearts, we know that he's righteous and that he's just. But the problem is, is that if God gives us justice, we all perish. So God, in his goodness and his mercy, sent forth his Son. I love in Galatians where it says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son born of a woman, born under the law. Because of his goodness and mercy, he sent Jesus. And Jesus, because he was born not of man but of, of woman, he is not born into that sin nature. His record is clean. And he keeps his record clean all through his life by obeying God's law perfectly. He is fully God and fully man, and he obeys the law of God on our behalf in what we call his active obedience. And then in his passive obedience, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Because we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own ways. 
But the Bible says that God laid our iniquity, he laid our sins upon Christ, and he died for our sins once and for all, the just for the unjust. God imputes our sinfulness to him, and he nails our sin to the cross of Christ, and Jesus dies and raises again on the third day for our justification, as Romans 4 says. And the righteousness of Christ is then imputed to us so that God can be both just and the justifier of the one who places his faith in Jesus Christ so that all those who come to Christ may enter in. All those who place faith in Christ might be saved. But not only saved, we are sanctified because he is the firstborn of many brethren, we are justified, we are adopted in, and we will be resurrected to new life. Jesus being the ruler of the kings of the earth means that that gospel is true. And that is the, the gospel is the weapon that we wield in this world to fulfill the great commission, to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that Christ commands. This also means for us, the gospel is true, but it also means for us what the end of verse 5 says. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom and priests to his God. As the faithful witness, he knows us in and out. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. I don't know about you, but that's scary. Because I know me, and I don't even like me some of the time. Jesus knows us. As the faithful witness, he he is the mediator between us and God. And he knows us. And it says that he loves us. And I don't just mean the way that, like, my dog loves me. You know, I I feed my dog. I pet him every now and then. (laughs) He loves me because I do something for him. Jesus, there is nothing we could do for Jesus. And the word says that he loves us. As the faithful witness, he knows us, he loves us, and so we should revere him. He has freed us from our sins. He paid the penalty that we owed. He takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. And so we should trust him. And finally, he makes us priests in his kingdom. Not only does he know us, but then he invites us to come be a part of the gospel work that he is doing around the world, making disciples of all nations, taking dominion for his kingdom with the gospel. He invites us to join him in that work, making us priests in his kingdom. And so we, should, we, we need to, it is necessary for us to worship him. My friends, if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. I encourage you to live with the assurance that Jesus is king. And no matter what happens in this crazy clown world that we live in, no matter what happens, nothing's going to change that. He is on his throne. He's not getting off. Let's pray together. Jesus, we recognize you and worship you this morning as king. Not just over the universe, but over our very lives. May we be given a boldness through this assurance of your kingship 
that is so strong that others can't help but see the reality of it and surrender themselves to you. We ask, Lord, that we would, through your Spirit, would cause us to revere you who love us, that we would trust in you with our whole hearts who has freed us from our sins, and that we would worship you who call us to be priests in your kingdom with our whole being. We thank you and praise you, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 May you go in peace.